Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about Intro to Ageism is Kyrie Carpenter. Kyrie is a corporate coach and ageism activist. She is co-founder of the anti-ageism clearinghouse, oldschool.info, and the editor of Changing Aging blog. Kyrie is the author of the book, Healing Dementia, that was featured in the New York Times. She has spoken at the International Alzheimer's Association Conference and the Eden Alternative Conference. Thank you for being here today, Kyrie. How are you? Thanks, Jason. Happy to be here. Doing well. How about yourself? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this webinar. So before we get started, for those joining us today, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, go ahead and type those into the box. And then time permitting at the end, we will do everything we can to get to those. So Kyrie, intro to ageism. Yes. Great. Thank you, everyone, for chiming in. You'll notice here on the first screen that says an old school workshop. And now one of the things I do to help dismantle ageism is I'm a co-founder of oldschool.info, which is a clearinghouse of anti-ageism resources. And I created this workshop in collaboration with one of my co-founders, Ryan Backer, and another friend of ours, Mel Coppola. And everything you need to give a one hour version of what's gonna be a 30 minute workshop today is on oldschool.info. And I'll tell you all more about that at the end, but just so you know, everything you're seeing here, we really want you to take and run with and share with your community because in order to end ageism, uh, it's gonna take all of us working together. But let's dive in and experience it first. So you'll see the title is Let's Dismantle Ageism. But first let's start with defining ageism. Ageism is prejudice against any person or persons due to their chronological age, just as racism and sexism are prejudices against people due to the color of their skin or their gender. Ageism works both ways, both against folks who are older and against folks that are younger. And just like other prejudices, ageism rarely exists in a vacuum. It rarely exists by itself. We often see multiple isms, such as racism, sexism, ageism, and ableism, affecting the same person. This is called intersectionality. In her TED Talk, Ashton Applewhite asks us to join a movement to end ageism. If you haven't watched her TED Talk called Ending Ageism, I would highly, highly recommend it. It gives a really great further intro into ageism and it complements well what we're gonna be talking about today. And you can see this quote by Simon Sinek, where he reminds us that in order for us to join the movement to end ageism, we have to really make the cause our own. Doing something just for those other people won't get us very far. We really have to take it inside of ourselves and make it our own. And that's why we're here today. I wanna help you see where ageism has shown up in your own psyche and in your own life and help you really make the cause of ageism your own. Why is ageism a cause of my own? Well, that all started when I was in grad school studying psychology and I was feeling a little bit of my own internalized ageism on the younger side. I was thinking I was too young to be a therapist. I didn't have enough life experience. And so I decided I wanted to work with older adults um, and doing my counseling with them in the hopes of figuring out some kind of a life hack to you know, hear their stories, figure out what to do and what not to do when it came to life and maybe figure out a way to give my future clients better advice, which shows that uh, I didn't know a lot about therapy because a good therapist should never give you advice. And I also didn't know about ageism because I was doubting my own abilities with people. But I did end up working um, with older folks for my clinical training. I ended up working with folks living with dementia, actually, work living in long-term care. And it was there that I was shocked at the difference between the people I was forming relationships with um, and the stereotypes that I've been told about them. And the folks I was working with have been living with dementia for quite some time and definitely hit all of the clinical markers, uh, but what they didn't hit were those stereotypes. There were no shells of themselves. There were no long goodbyes. I was meeting dynamic people that were teaching me a lot about how to live in this world. And when I dug into why I had these stereotypes that didn't match with the people I was meeting, I realized the root of it was ageism. And that was really my beginning to understand ageism, to see it both in myself and how it was stopping me from having meaningful relationships with people of different ages. And that's when I became passionate about helping to dismantle it. Because in order to change something as big as societal culture and ageism, we have to first start by changing ourselves. In order to change ourselves, we have to look deeply within and be honest because self-awareness is the first step in making 
any change. And I know this from my work as a coach um, and my work, you know, trying to help dismantle ageism. So right now I want you to think about in yourself, would you consider our culture to be ageist? Would you consider yourself to be ageist? We're going to do a little exercise to help look at ageism in our life. So first grab a you know, little scratch note of paper and I want you to think of the five people you choose to spend the most time with. And just write down the different age gaps between you and them. So maybe you spend a lot of time with your spouse. How many years difference is there between you, your best friend? Maybe you're raising, but think about people you choose to spend time with. So not necessarily coworkers. Um, what's the biggest gap? Is it more than five years? Uh, in, and then let's take this second one. Think to yourself, what is the last thing that you said or thought you were too old for? Maybe an outfit, an activity, a job. What was the last thing that you thought or said you were too young for? Maybe also an outfit or a job, depending on what your chronological age is right now. As you begin to reflect on the gaps in ages and the things we're too old and too young for, start to notice that, and we'll talk about this more, but in our culture, we're highly age segregated. You know, from the time we're five, we're put into kindergarten with folks the same age as us. And we're usually surrounded by folks sim of similar age to us, which makes it pretty difficult to have meaningful relationships without being intentional about it with folks of other ages, unless we you know, have had the good fortune to live intergenerationally. Our society also has a lot of ideas about what we're too old or too young to do. And so after thinking about all these questions, I want to ask those first two questions again. Do you think that our culture is ageist? How many of you would say yes now? And what about yourself? If you thought you were too young or too old for something, then the answer is yes. And that is because we are all ageist. And now ageism, when I say we're all ageist, I don't necessarily mean that we're all out there, you know, being horribly ageist and completely unaware and, you know, really uh, forwarding things. But what I do mean is that there's a continuum of ageism awareness. And some of us, we're completely unaware that ageism exists. We're completely aware of the stereotypes and the myths. We buy into them without any awareness. And some of us are maybe closer to the other end of the spectrum where we're fully conscious and aware of ageism in all of its forms. But I guarantee you, none of us, including myself, are fully at the conscious end of the spectrum. And we're gonna dive into exactly why that is. There's constantly work to be done and more reflection to be done, made to become consciousness. The truth also is while we are all ageist, ageism also affects us all. Let's explore. It starts early. Disney is a good example of how mainstream media um, exposes us to ageism from a very, very young age. In a study, um, 93 older characters from Disney movies were looked at uh, that over a 70 year period. So ageism has been with us for a while. Out of these 93 characters, 53% were portrayed as grumpy, evil, sinister, helpless, or sad, all negative attributes. 71% of the movies looked at had at least one negative portrayal of an older character. And it is interesting to note that older male characters were primarily in roles of authority, such as clergy members, whereas women tend to be more in the roles of, you know, the Wicked Witch, as you can see. That's that intersectionality again of ageism and sexism. Even kids' games perpetuate ageism. How many of us have played old maids? Have you thought about the fact that that's the one you don't want to get. And it continues as we get older. There's billboards and ads, greeting cards that bash getting older. Uh, you know, you can see here the subway has at age 80 who doesn't need a facelift. Uh, these are some pretty atrocious ads you can check out here. Basically, we are under a constant barrage of ageism. And unfortunately, until we reach a level of awareness, uh, we won't be able to be immune to constant attacks. And what happens is when we aren't aware of the ageism present in these ads, we literally buy in 
to ageism and the fact that it's okay to make fun of people, including ourselves, as we age. Uh, we also buy into the fact that age is, is about loss and decline. And then after years of experiencing ageism from a young, young age through our lives, we begin to internalize it. And we actually believe that our value lessens with our age. Um, so if you're trying to raise your own awareness about ageism and you wonder, is something ageist? Um, I want to point you to a resource. You can find it on oldschool.info. Um, but it's another website called Yo, Is This Ageist? And it's Ashton Applewhite curates this. And basically, if you see something out in the world that you think is ageist, but you're not sure, you can send it in. And she will answer whether it is or not um, a really great place to look for to help educate yourself on what is and isn't ageist. There's a lot of greeting cards on there, cartoons, different articles, um, lots of stuff, particularly now during COVID, as we've seen ageism having really, really dire consequences. Oh, when we think about the word aging, it is a synonym for the word living. From the day we're born till the day we die, um, we are both aging and living. So ironically, anti-aging would be synonymous with death. The very thing all of the anti-aging propaganda is really trying to get us to ultimately avoid. This is one of those moments that when I sort of figured out this flip the script that really shifted it for me. And I realized that um, the myth that we're being sold and many of us buy into of anti-aging really is a myth. And that um, to be anti-aging is really to be anti-living, which is death. And when we think about it like that, all of a sudden the face creams and the ads look a little bit different. And we need to stop allowing this to be our reality. We need to help others understand that this doesn't have to be their reality either. That aging can equal living and we can celebrate that and we can actually work not only to just celebrate aging, but to be anti-ageism. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the two different kinds of bias that are showing up. We've been talking about consciousness around ageism, and some of you may still be saying, I'm not ageist, I know what ageism is. And that might be true, and that means you don't have an explicit bias, but kind of like I said, even myself has implicit bias. Um, so let's dive into those a little bit more. So we've been receiving messaging all of our lives and it's led all of us to hold implicit bias. Implicit biases are automatic, unexamined thoughts. Um, this is, you know, an implicit bias would be that without even knowing that you're doing it, when you enter a party, you tend to go towards a group of people that look like you, whether that's the same age, the same, you know, ethnicity, the same style of clothes, we tend to be biased towards that. So that would be something you might not even think of while explicit bias is generally considered unacceptable. So this would be actually stating something saying, you know, old, old people don't know how to learn or young people are really irresponsible. That would be explicit bias. And most of us know that it's unacceptable to say things like that. But implicit bias is a lot more, is a lot sneakier and it's really difficult to find it because it coexists with our explicit thoughts, which are often contradictory. So you can explicitly say, no, I'm not ageist. I don't think people's value changes with their age. And you still might choose to hire the person that's a little bit younger without really thinking it through. So it's really all about making sure that you're aware of your biases and starting to think them through and bring them into awareness. Because when we can pull them out of the unconscious into the conscious, we can actually move forward. And this is part of the reason why in the very beginning, you might not have thought that you were ageist, even if you knew our culture was because um, your explicit thoughts are compassionate towards olders, and yet you might hold implicit bias that's hidden and unintentional and will crop up without you even knowing it. Language also has a huge impact on how we see our own aging and the assumptions that we make about others due to their perceived age. Uh, catastrophizing language is the worst, and mainstream media is increasingly using this to refer to the boomer generation as they enter elderhood. You might have heard the term the silver tsunami. Uh, our elders are by no means a natural disaster. If anything, they are more of a natural resource. And it should come of no surprise to anyone that at some point the boomers would have aged into elderhood. And now all of a sudden it's a devastating disaster and a crisis. That is ageism, not reality. The same is true with the victim narrative. It doesn't help care partners to see themselves as, as a victim burdened with care. And it doesn't help their other partner in care, the elder, to see themselves burdening their loved one. 
both of these examples show how language can pit the old versus the young. And we know from other social justice movements that the best way to perpetuate stereotype and stigma is to get two groups to invite. So by pitting old versus young, that actually helps increase ageism. What we wanna do instead is increase intergenerational solidarity. So not seeing anyone as burdens or as victims or as natural disasters. It goes both ways. You've probably heard the talk about how millennials are ruining everything. That is also ageism. And it really does beg the question of why we even label ourselves in generations and what the value of labeling ourselves in generations serves and if it really connects us or does it further divide us. Uh, this is one I think about a lot. And I think there definitely is value in naming generations when we're speaking to shared experience. And I think that there's also times when it's really important to leave the generational labeling out. Not only are the words we use important, but also how we use them. You'll likely recognize who this is. It is Queen Elizabeth, who is over 90 years old. And let's pretend that you just met her. And if you had the chance to talk with her, what would you say? Would you ask her what it was like to become queen at such a young age? Would you ask her thoughts on how the world has changed throughout the years that she's reigned? Or would your conversation go like this? Oh, queenie, sweetie, would you like some tea? Be careful, honey, that tea is hot. Here, let's blow on it together, shall we? Of course, you would never talk to Queen Elizabeth like that. And every person you interact with deserves no less dignity and treatment than the language we would give to a queen. Obviously, I'm exaggerating a bit here, but after today, you will all know elder speak when you hear it. It's a high-pitched tone using endearing words instead of someone's name, slower, exaggerated speech. It's not an appropriate way to speak to an older person. Neither is controlling language, a loud, firm tone with an authoritarian finality to it. And both of these types of language infantilize older people who've had long, full lives. And I know, you know, I know I've been guilty of this. It definitely is part of our culture, um, particularly for elders living in long-term care to rather than develop the relationship first to shortcut it by speaking sweetly, using terms like sweetie and honey before we have the relationship to really warrant a nickname or a term of endearment. Uh, there's a lot of power behind the words we use. So let's think about language a little bit in an exercise. So you've all probably heard this, I'm having a senior moment. Let's think for a second. What is ageist about this statement? So there's a, quite a few things that are. One thing I'll, I'll call out, think on your own though too, is that um, it implies that only folks who are older forget. What do we think the intent of this statement is? The intent is to just call out that you've forgotten something or that you need a moment to remember. And so when we realize that that's the intent, we can think about how to reword it so it isn't an ageist statement. So we might just be able to say, I forgot, or give me a second to think about it. Um, Ashton Appleweight has a great way to point out the ageism in this is, we didn't call it a junior moment when we lost our keys in high school. So it's not a senior moment now. We just forgot. And um, there's lots of ways. I would really encourage you, you know, this little part, this exercise is great to do with friends, if you want to give this workshop yourself, it's really fun to come up together with different things that you can say. Instead of having a senior moment, you know, I forgot. There's another one. I'm too old. I'm too young for that. I hear people say this all the time. You know, oh, I'm too young, you know, to for that job, not qualified enough. I'm too old to do yoga. You know, I should have started earlier, that kind of stuff. What's ageist about this statement? Um, what's ageist about this statement is that young and old a lot of times get thrown in place for some other different adjective and the reality is that once you are of adult age um where it's a consenting adult it's really problematic basically once you're 18 you can say what you want to do what you don't want to do so there's no way to use too young or old for that the only way this phrase would be appropriate would be if there was an age limit on something which in itself might not be appropriate uh, instead, yeah, think about this like really exposes social norms. So what does this statement mean? It usually means something different. It usually means, you know, I'm not qualified enough for that. Or I, you know, am injured and so I don't want to do that. Or a lot of times it means I don't want to do that too. So how can it be reworded? When you find yourself wanting to say I'm too young or too old for that, ask yourself what you mean by young or old and sub in that instead. Say, I'm too tired for that. I'm too smart to do that. Uh, you know, whatever it might be. 
All right, one more. You'll understand when you're older. This assumes that younger people, yeah, so why is this ageist? It assumes that younger people don't have emotional intelligence and can't empathize. Uh, it's intended to, and so what's the intent? It's intended to reassure youngers that they, once they have life experience um, from the previous generations have, that they will understand. Uh, but in reality, they may be able to understand at the moment. We don't know what people's life experiences are. So when you think about this, how could you reword it? Maybe just get curious rather than dismissing. So what happens with you'll understand when you're older is it dismisses the value of the person and stops the conversation. So rather than you'll understand when you're older, maybe ask them, do you have any questions about that? Instead of just shutting down the conversation. And then there are uh, compliments, which I'm sure we've all gotten. And there's three ways we want to equip you to respond to ageist compliments. So when I say an ageist compliment, this is something like when someone refers to you as young lady or young man and you yourself wouldn't identify with that. Let's say you're, you know, into middle life or beyond. Um, that's actually an ageist compliment because they're using young and old, which we really don't want to do anyways. And it's implying that to be young is to be better than the age you are. Um, so there's lots of these. So how can you respond to them without being smug or sassy? You can respond in kind. So imagine if someone said, you look great for your age, responding and saying, you look great for your age too. Can be a good way to respond if you want to, if you have a little bit of sass, that's part of your personality. Another um, way is to answer with pride. So let's say someone says, oh, you're 60? 60 is the new 40. Don't worry about it. You could be like, actually, 60 is the new 60. And I feel like I'm the perfect age. Um, or my particular favorite way, because I really feel like it invites conversations, is what do you mean? Uh, you know, so if someone says, oh, you're a baby. What do you mean I'm a baby? Or you're too old for that. What do you mean old? It really invites a conversation and calls out that implicit bias and really helps move the needle forward for both of you. So the next time you hear some ageist compliments, here are three ways to respond to them. Oh, all right. And so moving on, it is time for a radical age movement. We've had a chance to briefly look at how we got to this point of seeing our own aging selves and others in unkind eye. We've looked at how that's been compounded through institutionalized ageism and language. So how do we move forward from here? It's great to recognize it, but it doesn't do us any good if we don't move forward. Um, Ashton in her, temple, in her TED Talk invites us to join the movement against ageism. And there's a lot of great organizations and things to get plugged into out there to do just that. But in order to change things, we do really need to act because action changes things. So, and we know that ageism affects all of us. And so if we're gonna really take action to change things, we wanna make it personal. So I want you to think about what kind of actions you will take and think about the things that you can start doing, stop doing, and keep doing. If you need inspiration, um, I encourage you to check out oldschool.info, which has tons we have a full collection of basically anything that talks about ageism out there in the world is on there. There's organizations you can get plugged in with, there's videos you can watch, there's blogs you can read, there's books you can buy. Um, even this entire workshop, the deck, the commitment forms that you see me and my co-creators holding here on there, where you can say two things that you will keep doing to dismantle ageism, two things you can start doing and two things you can stop doing, you can sign it share it on social media, see other people's. I really encourage you to think up some things that you're gonna start, you know, and they can be really, really small. Maybe you will keep attending webinars like this, you know, maybe you will start asking people what they mean when you hear them use the words young and old, and maybe you will stop judging your own wrinkles in the mirror. You know, these can be really, really small actions in your own life. And those small actions will add up to a movement to end ageism. So for those of you willing, please do that. Post a selfie, get connected with us, because uh, it really is going to take each and every one of us to end the movement on ageism. I really do want you all to feel like you can get connected. Here's some great places you can get connected. Visit, again, like I've said, oldschool.info, the website. You can find me on there, too, so that's really the only one you need to remember. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me directly, my website is curiosity.com, K-Y-R-I-E. O-S-I-T-Y.com. 
Um, and as Jason said at the beginning, I'm also the editor of changingaging.org. So the word changing, the word aging.org, which is a pro-aging blog. Uh, submit, if you're a writerly type, please submit blogs to there. Uh, also check it out. We have a pretty good collection of the main thinkers in this space. Thank you so much for your time today. I know that was rapid fire, um, but feel free to go back, think more about those compliments, more about how you want to respond to ageist comments and the things that you can do to dismantle ageism. And I really encourage you to get plugged in in all the ways you can. Thank you so much for being here today. And just as a final reminder, this deck, the script, the commitment form um, are all on oldschool.info. So if you want to share this with your friends or family in a longer way and have those conversations um, that we sort of skipped over today to make it the speedy version, please, please do so. It's yours to take and run with. And I thank you so much for listening. Kyrie, you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay, we got a couple questions. The crowd, uh, I got two questions from our attendees. Uh, first thing is, do you think the pandemic is enhancing ageism? Absolutely, I do. I actually, I would say more than enhancing, I think it's exposing the pandemic okay. um, with, you know, whether it's triaging based on age that we saw earlier in Italy or, um, you know, the calls for what grandparents should or should not do during the pandemic. I think that the pandemic is exposing the fact that as a culture, we value olders less than youngers and also the intersectionality of ageism and ableism. We also value people um, of differing abilities less than those, you know, that are the most productive GDP producers. I think it's really being highlighted and exposed in its most deadly form. And it's a really great opportunity for us to, now that it is exposed, work to dismantle it. Very good. I think you also kind of just touched on this, but the other last question is in other countries, you know, the older people are treated with great respect. Why do you not think that's the case here in the U.S.? That may be a loaded, that yeah, may be a loaded question. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I don't mind loaded questions. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one, that can be a bit of a trope. Unfortunately, we have exported our ageism along with um, a lot of other parts of our culture. Um, and so that is unfortunately changing even in some of those societies. Um, honestly, I think a big part of it was, you know, post-World War II, we were really age segregated. Um, starting in school, like, kind of, like I mentioned, at five, you get put in a little box of kindergarten with, you know, kids within a year of your age, and then you're with people in one year of your age pretty much throughout your schooling, unless you do something non-traditional. Then you start the workforce at the same age. We really shouldn't have exposure to folks of different age. Then we sit in little boxes called offices, and then we eventually end up in long-term care. Um, and so I think we're highly age segregated in America and in uh, countries that have a longer history than ours. Um, they just have more intergenerational interaction built into their way of life. Uh, I also think we have a little bit of an obsession with everything that's new and shiny, which again is just sort of part of being a younger country. Uh, there's a lot more to that. And I would say, I would highly recommend diving into, Ashton also wrote a book called This Chair Rocks that really is everything you could possibly wanna know about the origins of ageism, comparing it to other countries, um, how it is, why it is, and what to do about it. So if you're curious about that, I'd suggest that you go there. Very good. Well, thank you, Kyrie. We really do appreciate your time. Uh, till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging.